that is just awesome, guys. Thanks for joining us. And today we're going to meet again with Miss Allison, one of our, oh, Gabriella's here. North Owen's from North Vancouver, Owen and Aiden. That's awesome. Hi. Gabriella's here. Hazel's here. Wow, we're just popping in. Um, Edith is from Akalawit, Nunavut. Maybe she'll type in the chat which school she goes to because one of we had a really special concert on TV last night. Miss <gasps> Allison and they showed Ecole Trois Soleil. That's right, and they showed some of the schools and the teachers from Akalawit helping with the breakfast program. And I, I kept pointing and saying, "I know that." I was yelling, saying, "I know." Oh, that. that's so exciting! So today we're going to meet with Miss Allison and talk about one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And one of the oldest cities in the world, over in Italy, Rome, um, they say all roads lead to Rome. And I think if you really think about it, all roads do lead to Rome. And we're going to learn about some amazing um, objects and artifacts from Rome, as well as how people lived in Rome So, at, in ancient times. So what we would like you to think about, because we don't have the worksheet, but I'm going to show you where it is at the end of the session. We'll show you where it is. At the end, I'd like you to think about comparing the house in Rome to comparing the house where you live in a near community. Because I know when we did this session with the students in Iqaluit, we we had a lot of comparisons to some of the tools that they used, which was so exciting. So just think about how a Roman house is the same and how it is different from your house. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Miss Allison, and we'll see you in a little bit. Thanks. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well on this Monday. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out. I seriously love teaching all of these sessions. So I am really, really excited to be time traveling with you, to be meeting some new friends and maybe seeing some of our friends that we've seen earlier since we've all been learning at home or maybe even before we were learning at home. Now, I love to see everybody in the chat box saying hi to everybody because trust me, I like our programs to be interactive, and even though I might not be as big on the screen because I'll have my PowerPoint show, showing during our presentation, I'm going to be here and asking you guys questions to use that chat box. So if you see me kind of looking in two different ways, it's so that I can see you and my presentation, okay? Now, if anyone didn't catch it or just entering, my name is Miss Allison, and I am going to screen share. I'm going to share my screen. If I am allowed, Miss uh, Katie, it doesn't look like I can share my screen. Yeah, I'm just fixing that for you now. Sorry, Miss Allison. Oh, no worries. All right, guys. See, it's Monday, and now we are started. Okay, I am going to bring my chat over here so that we can all, I want to make sure to get that up because that's my favorite part is making sure to stay connected with all of you. So what you guys see next to me is actually the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. That's where I work, and it is a huge name, okay? So we actually call ourselves the Penn Museum for short. For some of you guys who I've met before, you might know that we have a global collection. Now, we're located specifically in um, Philadelphia. So that's in the state of Pennsylvania in the United States. So we're not super, super far away from each other. Now, our job in this museum that you see on your screen is to do one thing, which is study human history. And that's what we're going to do today. We are going to study human history together. We're going to learn just like you were just told how we're similar and different from people that lived thousands of years ago and even people that live around the world today. We're similar and we can also talk about our differences, right? Now, what I always say is we don't just depend on looking at our collection. We actually have this one big question all of us ask ourselves because we study archaeology and anthropology, okay? Now, this is the first time we are go we I see some of you guys are excited about this and that some of you want to go to Rome. Trust me, I understand that desire, and don't worry, eventually you'll be able to get there. But today what we'll do is we'll skate to Rome a little bit using this Rome gallery in the building I work, I work for, work in, I should say. 
Now, the big question we do, if we really want to understand human history, the way that we approach that is by asking ourselves as archaeologists and anthropologists, how do we know what we know? Now, can I have some of you guys in the chat box, can you tell me, what are some of the resources you typically use to learn from? Can you go ahead and put that in the chat for me, and I'll read out as many as I can, as fast as I can, I promise. Okay, so I have, somebody mentioned a book, somebody mentioned Google, very nice. Hopefully you can use Google to get to that credible source. You might even have a textbook or a book you love to get more information. Old stuff, I love that, great response. I also hear about fossils and dictionaries. Okay, great. Wikipedia, yes, okay, Wikipedia again. Hopefully that gets you that credible source. Artifacts, love that somebody just said artifacts. The internet, the library. Um, we also have been talking about the digital age, right? We're all digital. Uh, we all have this digital connection. So hopefully we can um, make sure to be able to use that, not just connect to the internet, but maybe even to one another. Learn from our teachers, like you're learning at home, and also from our friends and our families, right? And then history and books. Okay, great job, great job, guys. Now, I love what you guys all just mentioned. Oh, and I love that we're even, we're even talking about archaeologists. Good. So some of you guys are on to it. You already knew where I was going with that. So the idea is that most of what we've just talked about, right, or my, the majority of what we were talking about are something that relates to things that are written down. This history, this connection to the past by, ob uh, by looking into what we call written sources. Now, these texts, these pieces of writing, they're really good to help us inform our understanding. But get this, guys. When we look across ancient worlds, we actually find out there was only one group of people typically hired and educated to read and write. They didn't have the privilege that we all do today, learning how to read and write. Now, these um, individuals, these groups of people that were trained to read and write, they're called scribes. Now, these scribes were typically men. They were typically living in the middle of a city. They were really, really educated, and they were typically hired by rulers. Now, that creates a problem because it means these scribes are only writing down one form of history, right? They're kind of leaving out lots of different parts of the population. So it's not giving us a full view of what, we under, of what daily life was really like this set of behaviors that connect a group of people, their culture. That's why, like some of you guys have mentioned in the chat box, learning from artifacts, objects like what you can see in the museum at the Ped Museum and online right now and what we'll talk about today, these objects help fill in the gap. We don't have written history talking about people of lower classes, people living outside of cities or even women or children your age, right? Instead, these artifacts Go in the, they fill in the gap. These individuals, they help us connect a little bit more deeply to the ancient past because we're learning from what people used every day, like their spoons, what they sat on, what they wore. These are artifacts that will inform people about how we all live in 2020. Now, we have actually been excavating for over 100 years, and we've been on excavations on almost every single continent. Now, typically, these excavations, that's just a big word for a big dig, like what you see on your screen right here, often reveal ancient cities. And within those ancient cities, we get connections to the buildings, the structure, the setup, that we actually can kind of mirror or see how they're similar or different to us. And the other cool thing, guys, we find lots of objects. But we know artifacts, that's not enough information. Finding an object doesn't tell us everything we need to know. Instead, finding the object, that's just the first step. We know that in archaeology, you have to work as a team because our goal is to study culture, understand the culture that's connected to that part, that object, that material culture is what it's called. Now, today what we're going to do is we are actually going to put a special focus and think like archaeologists, which really just means we're going to use our eyes and our critical thinking skills to try to understand and interpret the past using an, a real-life example of a dig that occurred in the 1930s. Now, what we are going to do is we're going to put a little bit of a special
special focus on language. Now, I always get so excited when I teach with you guys because you teach me so much. Last week, and I think I actually wasn't two different words, now, Miss Nellie, that we actually heard. I got to learn so much about different ways that you communicate through writing, through speaking, through different languages. So we're going to just put a small focus on what that looked like in ancient Rome. And we're gonna use one story that was unveiled or unearthed by our archeologists to understand a little bit more about what life was really like during that time. Now we do, my friends, we do have real life human remains, including 13 bones, uh, 13 mummies that are part of our collection from ancient Egypt, but we're gonna leave mummies out. Trust me, we can talk about that later. We've spent enough time in Egypt, we're now gonna move on over to Rome, right? Like some people said, we're gonna put our togas on, but don't worry, I'm always happy to go back to Egypt another time. Now, I had this really, we have this really cool special place in the middle of our museum. Now this, this place is called the Archives. The Archives is basically like a library. It holds every single record from archeological digs. And let me tell you, archeologists, they love taking notes. So not only do we have videos, handwriting, hand-drawn maps, we have so many different photos that help us kind of understand and document, that's the real goal, document what happened on that big dig. Well, these two men you see on the screen, they were both interested in understanding the classical world in the Mediterranean area a little bit better. They were specifically interested in understanding how people in ancient, in the ancient Roman Empire, okay, lived. So lucky for them, they were able to get a strong enough argument together. They got their expedition accepted, and thankfully, on their first dig, they actually started revealing the ancient past. Now, this is lucky, because I won't lie to you guys, sometimes people really think that they know where something is. Then they dig and they dig and they don't find anything. That's a frustrating season. But thankfully for our archaeologists today, we, oh, it looks like somebody has a neighbor that's an archaeologist. So maybe you can go and talk a little bit about, um, talk about some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today. That's super cool. Now, what we're going to first do is we're going to think about some tools. Now, I'm going to ask you guys to head over to the chat feature again. I am going to show you a video in just a moment, and I want you to type as fast as you can the different tools you see your archaeologists, our archaeologists in the film, using. Okay, so this is like their home film. Ready, set, tell me the tools you see. What do you see, guys? I'll read them out. Okay, somebody says a brush. Good job, a big paintbrush. What else do we see? A shovel. Good job. A shovel. Good job. Yes, what's he doing? A wheelbarrow, good job. If anybody's a Minecrafter like me, that's a pickaxe. So we have a pen, good job picking up on that pen. Now guys, what you see is at the very beginning, we actually had just the start of a dig. Check it out, this wall right here, we did not know that went a mile into the earth. And look at how good you are. We already have so many people telling me about our next object, the next tool, that bucket or that pail, right? So that bucket or that pail is extremely important because guys, guess what? You might be thinking, oh, okay, it's the 1930s. That's why we are going to be seeing that bucket removing the dirt. Well, get this, even in 2020, we remove dirt with buckets. The reason is, is because we have to be extremely careful when we're moving. And if you ever want an internship or a volunteer, that's a really great place to start removing that type of dirt. Because if you look really close right here, okay, you can see we are actually revealing another building. Now remember, we have absolutely no clue that this wall was going to extend a mile into the earth. We have no idea what this building could be. So if I bring down this huge digger, pull it up, I am not going to be able to save that history. And that's our goal. We want to preserve the past as much as possible. Okay, so now that we have a little bit more of an understanding of how we work, we're going to go focus right on to that ancient world. We're going to be kind of focusing on the objects you see in this little corner. Now, if you guys ever come to the Penn Museum, which I hope you do in the future, and I'll be back into hopefully soon, I'm currently teaching from home, right? We're actually 
going to be able to visit these wonderful artifacts on the top floor, the second floor of our museum, okay? Now, first thing I like to do, if you guys are archaeologists, the first thing you have to do is make sure you know where in the world we are headed. So, I want you guys to tell me, if I want to know about ancient Romans, when they lived in the empire at the largest, when it was at its largest, can you tell me, where am I headed? And good job, guys, with all of your other responses. Okay, I have lots of people saying Italy. I have people saying Europe. Very good, guys. I love that the, uh, um, the Italy in exclamation points, too. It's one of my favorite places. So, great. I always try to, like, box in this one area, okay? This is kind of like the epicenter of what I like to say, the Middle East. And I love that we all know where Italy is, right? That's that boot that hangs right off of Europe, the continent of Europe, which you guys did such a great job naming into this Mediterranean Sea. Now get this, when ancient Romans were at, when the Roman Empire was actually at its largest, it stretches so big, it actually goes everywhere you see in red. When the, Roman, when the Roman Empire was at its largest, it stretches all the way north up to Great Britain. It stretches all the way west over to modern-day Spain. It goes all the way east over to the Middle East. That's how we define it today. So it's kind of sandwiched in between the continent of Asia and Europe. And get this, guys. In 30 BCE, Romans actually conquer the Egyptians. And what that means is they actually pick up at the very southern end part of Africa. So we have Europe, we have some of Egypt, we have some of, um, we have some of the Asian continent in our Middle East area, and we have um, the African continent, right, where Egypt is located. And it's cool that some of you guys have said that you've lived in different places, like the Middle East that we see here, and I love that somebody called out my big, the biggest place we're talking about today, which is this ancient city of Pompeii. Now, guys, we could have learned about 70 million people that were living at the Roman Empire when it was at its largest. But I decided, let's take time and let's learn about ancient Roman life by talking about people in Pompeii. So, can I hear from our friends in the chat box? Can you tell me, what happened in Pompeii? Why do we know it so well? Let's see if I get a couple similar responses, and we'll see, it, and I'll share with our group. Okay, so right off the bat, I have lots of people telling me that they have volcano. Absolutely, we have a volcanic eruption with exclamation points. Now, who can tell me? No worries if you can't. I just always like to ask, does anyone know the name of that volcano? No big deal if you can't spell. Spelling is not a problem. Uh, look at how good you guys are. I have lots of people spelling Vesuvius, right? Mount Vesuvius, good job. So Mount Vesuvius most definitely did erupt. Now, before we jump into that, I have one last question to ask you guys. Just pushing it a little bit further, since you guys seem to know a lot about Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius and, the, and this ancient city, who can tell me when the volcano, because it did erupt, when all of a sudden, what pummeled out of the volcano first and then fell all over the ancient city? Okay, I'm going to wait for just a couple of responses and I'll see what comes out. You guys are so good. So there are some suggestions of rocks, maybe some overflow, and then we have lots of suggestions of ash. You guys are so good. It's absolutely ash that is going to become this uh, hardening, hardened layer, which is kind of that rock feature that some of you are talking about. And this ash layer is definitely what causes the most and the first type of destruction. You guys are so good. Now, Mount Vesuvius most definitely did erupt. It actually was a full 24-hour period on an August day in the first century that this happened. Now, ancient Pompeii was actually a city that was seen as kind of a vacation town, even though it was a really busy area. Now, what you can actually see is, unfortunately, this ash layer, like you told me, did absolutely pummel right out of Mount Vesuvius. Now, this ash layer is extremely toxic, where it freezes people and places completely in time. 
Now, what that means is you can actually go in, when you actually can excavate these places, everything is frozen in time. So it's like the objects are waiting for people to come back and use them, even though the homeowners won't return. Now, get this. This is the big reason I wanted to talk to you guys about this specific area is because there was actually one small group of people that were able to leave this destruction. They actually were able to kind of wipe off that ash enough and retreat to get away from that 24-hour period until they could return to getting safe. Now, one of those individuals in that small group, they actually had one person that knew how to read and write. Now, that person went back. He wrote about what happened in, uh, with Mount Vesuvius in this ancient city of Pompeii. And then that's all it was. For over 1,500, over 1,500, not 1,000, guys, 1,500 years, Pompeii became this very, very grassy area that shepherds would bring their sheep. They would then also be able to wait until about the 1700s when an archaeologist decided, you know what, I want to test this ancient piece of writing. Is there really an ancient city under, underneath this area that shepherds are bringing their sheep? And guess what, guys? They dug and they dug until eventually they actually found evidence of this ancient city. Now, this picture right here that you see on the bottom, this is actually one of our pictures. This is 2006, uh, 2016, so a couple years ago, four years ago now. You can see some archaeologists here. They're actually in a ditch. Now, today, there's only about two-thirds of this area excavated. We actually will see that the, there, you can actually see that they're still revealing new information each day because we don't have the full city revealed. Now, what I always like to show is even though we have these ancient we even though we have these ancient ruins right here, this is Mount Vesuvius still looming over these places. Now, because they were in such good condition, meaning that the ash layer, while extremely destructive, kept everything in place within the home, we actually are able to have an understanding of how these objects you see in the display cases were used. And also, it was so well preserved that we were able to make this house model that sits in the middle of our Rome gallery, right? Now, I love that somebody earlier called out a pen and a notebook. Um, yes, the, sorry, I just saw in the chat there was a question about the person that is in all white looking like they're marble. It's very, very good. This is, um, it's definitely, we're actually going to zoom in on some of them later, so don't worry, you're definitely on the right track. Look at those observation eyes like an archaeologist. Now, the reason I really love the idea of somebody calling out the pen and the paper that we saw the archaeologist using at the beginning of this video is because guess what, guys? Guess what they were reading? They, they were writing. They were actually drawing a hand-drawn map, a floor plan, if you will, of what that specific house looked like in ancient Pompeii. Now, what you guys see is that floor plan. It's kind of like we are all birds sitting above the house looking down. What we're going to do today is we are going to explore each space you see numbered. And after this program, you guys can go and you can take this from your website and you can either fill it out by watching this video again, or you can, uh, you can fill it out by watching this video again, or you can um, write down different, different uh, languages that you speak and you write. You can use that to identify the areas as well because we're all going through it together. Now, what we're going to do is learn how ancient Romans spoke with one another. So ancient Romans weren't we're actually speaking Latin, so we're going to look at their terms. Like you see here, this word is duo mas. So if you guys are at home, you can still do this with me if you want to. You can break it down by syllable by saying duo mas. Duo mas. This means house. Good job. Now, this duo mas is going to be what we're exploring. Now, the next thing I always like to do is set up is set up how it looks, what it would be like there. Now, these here are very much set up like a city. Now, can I hear from a couple of you? Where you are, do you have lots of space in between your neighbors? I know we have a couple different people here from different places. So do you have lots of space in between your neighbors or in your communities, do you have houses that are very close together or maybe like a combination of both? Okay, so it looks like 
We have some people saying sort of, kind of, a little bit of space. It looks like we have people that don't have lots of space and some that do have lots of space. Great. I love this. Both. Okay, great. Now, I also like to see, can you guys put just yes or, ooh, okay, we have a, we have different types of backyards. Some, some people are saying that they have smaller amounts of space in smaller communities. And then others that are saying that there's lots of space and then some that are saying that there's not too, too much. So that is so cool because actually that's how it kind of works here in Philly or in Pennsylvania. So in Pennsylvania, what happens is in Philadelphia, that's like a big city. We have a center of that city. Now that center city is where lots of people are living really, really close together. So maybe in your community, you might have one area where you have lots of shops. You might have a different place where you're able to kind of see those communities and those houses getting closer together. And then in other areas, you have big backyards. Like some of the, um, some of the, some of our friends are saying that they would have a lot of different spaces, right? That's kind of how we, how it works when you're getting away from our center city. Now, wow, somebody says their closest neighbor lives one kilometer away. Wow, good. That is interesting. My, my closest neighbor, I live in more of like a complex. My closest neighbor literally shares a wall with me, so they might be hearing it. And interestingly enough, in ancient Rome, it was set up really similarly. Now, here in Philly, this is an example of how our houses are set up. We have the front. We don't have a lot of spaces. We share walls quite often with our neighbors. And so the front of our houses actually sit and face the city streets. Our houses extend back. We share the walls. And then the back of our house, and I am really, really envious of you guys with big backyards because they are not very big. They are extremely, extremely, extremely small. And we also, in some cases, because, yep, it looks kind of like a brownstone. So these are kind of, these are similar type of like townhomes in Philly that might look like brownstones you guys are familiar with. We also, because we're so busy, not only have people living in these buildings, in some cases, we actually share these buildings with businesses. So something else that uh, you might see in your communities as well. Now, ancient Romans, right? Let's make sure that we understand who was living in our Duomas, okay? Now, I cut off the wall of one side of our house model so that we can kind of check it out inside. We're gonna enter right here. And then we're going to walk all the way through and end right here in this specific room. We're going to look at artifacts that were discovered in those spaces. I made sure to actually contact our archives. So I have all of the images that were cleaned up to show you like the cleaned up version, not just the model version. And we're going to just kind of talk together using that chat feature to think like archaeologists. Now, first question, by sheer size of this house. What type of Roman do you guys think lived here? A really, really elite, wealthy uh, Roman or a citizen with very little wealth? What do you guys think? What type of Roman would have lived here? Okay. I have lots of people saying, this is elite. They would definitely be elite Romans, rich, wealthy. You guys, so, so, so good. I always love this. You guys are so great. Now, absolutely these are the people that are going to have the most wealth. Now, these are kind of like the sports stars, the celebrities in your life. Not many of us live like these sports stars and celebrities in some cases. And trust me, not many Romans live like these individuals. These homeowners definitely had wealth. This also means, and what we find evidence of, is that these individuals also had a political connection. That means that they're working on behalf of the empire. They're kind of keeping things in place for the emperor. And they're also having a social connection. So the social connection, what that means is, is that quite often what you need to do to keep working for the empire is kind of making sure that you're voted in by your citizens. So that means if someone's coming over and asking for a favor from this homeowner, they would have a lot of ability to make favors happen. Now, most Romans, right, they actually lived in apartment-style buildings called insula. So you have multiple houses in one building. All right. So I think you guys are also smart. Now, what we're going to be doing is right here we know we're going to explore our, explore our homes. We're gonna learn our Latin language. And most importantly, we know who's living here, right? So we have our context clues, my archeologist, all of you guys. Now, we're gonna start. Number one, 
our first place we are going to be experienced is right out front. Now, this here, is this very, very front of the home is actually called a tabernacle. So everyone at home that wants to try to say some of these Latin terms, you want to say tabernacle. Tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle is like a shop. Now, I always say that just like today, ancient Romans, they needed to make sure that they had the materials and what they wanted and what they needed to get through their lives, right? So they needed food, they needed clothing, and then they might want some extras, like how to decorate their house. Now, here's the thing. Ancient Romans that lived in a house like we see here on our Tapernai, they actually didn't operate this shop. Instead, what they did was they collected a special, uh, they kind of collected a rent, a monthly rent from the homeowner. These home, I mean, these business owners would then operate any kind of business they wanted out of these tabernacles. So they could be um, storefronts that held a whole bunch of goods. Now, our evidence, what we have, I love you guys saying tabernacle too, you're so good. Now, what we have evidence of, guys, is actually kind of like an ancient cafeteria or an ancient, uh, like, fast food spot, meaning right here, and you'll see this when you have that worksheet, we have a collection, this one structure that has big circles in it. That's actually what big, big volumes of liquid, that's what would hold them. We find out that this window was a place where someone could go and get something to drink. They would play, they would, any citizen can go up, pay a small fee, and then they would be able to get a drink from the person of the shop owner. Then you'd go over to this window, you'd grab something to eat with a small fee, and then you could take it anywhere you want. Maybe you could sit down, you could hang out on the city street there, or maybe you'd take it back home, okay? I know, there's a little person. So I hope you guys like it. I tried to make it as animated as possible for you guys. I usually am on a green screen, so I always like to try to make it fun. It's Monday and we're learning. All right, cool. So we know that this is the shop. Now let's enter our house. But before we enter, I always like to tell you guys, guess what? Ancient Romans actually left the front door of their house open and unlocked all day, every day. Is there anybody, you can tell me in the chat feature, anybody want your front door open and unlocked like this all day, every day? Anybody? <laughs> I see lots of people saying, no, no way. Why? No. Absolutely. I am the same way, guys. I won't lie to you. I listen. Nope, nope, nope. I like that. I listen. I listen to way too many podcasts and I watch some crime drama shows. So I enjoy my lock, right? And ancient Romans, even though they weren't using the same technology like the locks and keys that we use today, we actually do see that they are trying to protect their home. They're just doing it a little bit differently with another type of um, technology. So can anybody right here, all right, you can tell me in the chat box and I'll try to read as fast as possible. I'm loving how chatty you guys are. It's like literally making my day. Can you tell me what is this figure right here? Why did they did that? So why, you guys are putting this in. I'm going to answer that question. Go ahead and keep telling me what you think that figure is. The reason they did this was just because they had a different understanding of the world. They just weren't using the same type of technology. That's a really, really great question, Lily. Okay, great. So I have a couple, I have a couple suggestions that it looks like a dog. It looks like a specific dog, maybe even a husky. And you guys are so good. And maybe a wolf or a wolf dog. Ooh, that sounds fun. Now, well, you guys are, you guys impress me so much because check it out. It is in fact a dog. And maybe there is a suggestion. Maybe this is a guard dog. Maybe it's a dog that wanted to scare people away. So you guys are already doing the next thing. Ready? Check it out. We're gonna act like archeologists now. I want all of you guys to use your observation tool, your eyes, and our context clues, right? The context clues that we have available to us to help us think like archeologists and make an informed guess or hypothesis is one, the image of a dog. Two, we have writing at the bottom. This writing is called Kawe, Hanum. Okay. Now, putting all of these context clues together, who can tell me what do you think Kawe Kanam could mean? What could Kawe Kanam mean? A 
Okay, so I have some suggestions of people saying maybe they they don't know, go away, keep out. You guys are getting there. Stay away, dog. Oh my goodness, Edith, I'm gonna give it to you. You got it right. It's absolutely the meaning is beware of dog. And you guys didn't even need my per personal example. So guys, right outside of my house, I actually created my own mosaic that does actually mean beware of dog. Now, thankfully, my friends know that I in, I actually have a physical animal, right? <laughs> However, my uh, male person did not love this sign so much. They much preferred the sign that my a neighbor has on their door, which helps them know, hey, there's a physical dog behind here. So this isn't where you want to put, uh, you want to be careful, okay? Now, thankfully, you know, I have some friends that know the classical world. So you guys just did a great job. What you just did was you used your observations and you made a claim and your claim ended up being correct and you worked it out together as a team. Now, what you guys suggested at first was this was a way to kind of protect the house. It absolutely was. Ancient Romans weren't saying, hey, a physical dog is going to come running down the hallway at you. But instead, what they're saying is that this house is protected by the gods. If you're entering this home, you will be watched. So you must be on your best behavior. Now, this here is actually one of the most popular art making forms that we can connect to ancient Romans, which is mosaic making. Um, it does look a little bit creepy. I do like that people were saying hi to the doggy. He's so fierce, but also so lovable. Um, and I wanna know from you guys, how many of you, just let me know in the, in the chat box, how many of you guys have made a mosaic before? All right, so it looks like we have one of our friends have made a mosaic before, and if you wanna share, uh, what materials do you have used to make a mosaic? What are some of the materials you use to create that mosaic for those of you that are able, that I've shared that you have? Yes, okay, great. So those that said that they did actually create a mosaic, which is what that Kawe Kanem image that we were looking at before, had suggested that they use glass. Some of them use paint samples. Oh, I love that. Paint samples from Home Depot is super cool. Maybe they use different types of um, paper and glue, stickers. You may have even created one with coloring. Absolutely. Now, I love this. Now, ancient Romans, they actually had a really specific way of making mosaics. They created, they actually cut stone to be the size of your thumbnail. So if you guys all want to look down and check out your thumbnail, that's approximately the size of one piece of tesserae. Tesserae are the small, it just means small cubed piece in Latin. Now, what happens is ancient Romans would put down all of their different color tesserae in one specific pattern. They then would pour cement on top. Now, lucky for them, they actually created cement, so they were pretty skilled at working for it. So they knew that once you actually put that cement on top, you would be able to wipe it away quickly, keeping, that, keeping all of that cement in place. Now, this was important because ancient Romans used mosaics to communicate. Remember, they're making an empire. So they're going into different areas and they are trying to use pictures to communicate about new rules, new laws, new rulers. And in other cases, ancient Romans are really similar to us. They want their houses and their buildings to look pretty cool. So what they did was create patterns with that tesserae to create their flooring, or even in some cases their wallings or the flooring of their tombs, which we see more often than you would expect. Now, this is one example of a piece of mosaic in our museum that came from this area. And it actually is just one piece of it that needed specific help being uh, with some scientists that we have working here. And what I wanted to do was make sure you guys saw kind of this video. Now, this video here is of one specific team um, that has decided to make, like they've identified exactly where we need to get that uh, piece of the mosaic to have help. You can see here, this is our house all boxed in. And then right here is some of the cleaned mosaic in that house that we're talking about today. Now, this one section is being it's kind of like this metal tool that it has about six inches underneath. It's kind of being pulled up while this specific cylinder is totally wrapped in foam. So it's really, really soft. The next thing that happens and is super special and another part of like this idea of museum work is this box right here. Now this specific uh, piece of wood is cut to be a specific size for that object. 
This way we can make sure it's secured nicely and then we can wrap it up before it goes back to the scientists that need to have the little bit of help. And I always like to make sure you guys see how much cement puddles underneath all of those pieces of tesserae, which is why you have those, um, those different breaks. Now, <clears throat> let's move in. The second spot we're going to look in in this house is called the atrium. Now, the atrium is a place where people are going to kind of hang out with their family or their friends. And this is the place in the house that someone's going to wait if they're the visitor, if they're visiting the homeowner. Can you guys give me a suggestion? What's that like in the house that you are in today, uh, that, uh, like your home today? What would that area be called? The atrium. Ooh, okay, so we have one example that's like a living room. Absolutely, it is exactly like a living room. So can you guys tell me, what are your favorite objects in your living room? Like, what's a favorite object to use in your living room? Okay, I have the couch, the TV. Oh, or a mudroom is, is, might be another term for the living room. So the couch, the TV, toys, PS3, that's awesome. I'm a PS player as well. I do, I am a PS4 and an Xbox. So either one is cool. Piano, oh, that's wonderful. You all, I have another uh, person that likes the TV. Books, musical instruments, I love to hear this. And lots of books. Oh, you guys are so good. So I am so cool that there's, an, it's also really cool that there's another gamer in the room. Um, I am part of gaming culture, so we may have met before. So the Wii, the Xbox, and the PS4, I actually play them all. More PS4, though, than anything else. And I also really love that couch. I definitely, it's been definitely a transition to not go to sleep on that couch when we're learning from home. Right, guys? So this living room is exactly kind of what happens at the atrium. We have collections of different, um, kind of different objects that people would use, one of them being a toy People here would actually be able to read and write, and what they would do is actually center all around this one area that sits in the middle of the atrium. It's called the impluvium. Now, remember, guys, oh, it's, kind, it's similar to a fireplace, but a little different. Now, remember, we actually have no air, we have no windows, right? We're sharing our walls with our neighbor. So the only access we have is to this skylight, this impluvium, which is open and isn't covered by glass or screen. They haven't even started making glass yet right here. And absolutely, Edith gave, as Edith and Maddie, good job. You guys absolutely just gave a really great suggestion, which is they said, is this rainwater? Is this a place to hold rain? And you're absolutely correct. If you can see right here on really rainy days, the structure of the house, the roof of it, actually all pushes in together, okay? Now, that means all of the rainwater flushes to this one impluvium in the middle of the atrium. So this is kind of like a four-foot pool that sits in the middle of their living room. Now, they're not taking, they're not really bathing in it. They're not drinking it. That would make them really, really sick. But what is interesting, it actually is a connection to an ancient technology. Now, what they, they believe is a, a one role that this impluvium played was on really, really hot days. This rainwater would actually get so hot, it would evaporate. That evaporated water would rise up and cool off the entire front part of the house. Kind of like an ancient air conditioner or how we could get an air conditioner to cool off using air today. Um, I did get a question, which is a really good question, which is how does the house not get wet? Great question. Now, remember, this entire house is actually covered in mosaic flooring. So because it's stone, it's actually quite easy to, um, you know, if it gets wet, it's not as, as difficult. It would probably be slippery, but not as difficult as if, like, you had carpeting in your homes today. Very, very good question. So good job, guys. Ask those questions. Use that chat box. Now, what we found out, because I always like to make sure you guys see everything cleaned up because it took a long time, is right here is us in the vestibulum of our home, one, the one we made the house model out of. You can see all of that cleaned off flooring. And then right here, guys, is actually another house, but it was a rainy day, and they actually were able to have the um, rainwater collect right into that impluvium like it would 2,500 years ago. And then we did have some archeologists working on this stonework you see in the back. And guess what guys, it didn't give them that much relief. It was like as if you fanned your, your hands in front of your face. 
And then we had another we had another question again about the idea of it overflowing. So overflowing or it getting the water getting wet on making the floor wet. This is totally something that could happen. But remember, the tesserae, the mosaic flooring, is made of stone. So that will make it quite easy to clean up, but it would be slippery. Very good questions, guys. Now, the next place that we're going to go into is actually representing our first plural term, many spaces. We have four rooms that match. They are called the cubicleum. So if anybody wants, is doing this at home, the cubicleum, we have four of them. You can peer into two right here, and then we have an additional two between these door frames. So who wants to give me a suggestion in that chat box? What do you think the cubiclium is? If we have four with the same name and matching purpose. Oh, okay, so we have a couple suggestions, two different ones. We have some people that are saying maybe the bathroom. We have some people that are saying the bedroom. Okay, so very good, guys, or where maybe where food is made. All right, all great suggestions, but I will tell you, this is absolutely the bed, or maybe both, the bedroom. So this would be exa an example from uh, an IKEA website. I took this right off of that website, um, just getting credit. So our modern bedrooms might be very different than the cubiclium we see here. They're much smaller, right? They don't look like they have a lot of, uh, they don't have a lot of furniture, and guess what? The cubiclium would be basically be about the size of a like a modern day closet. They were extremely, extremely st small, but guess what, guys? Very, very decorated. Now, when we walk into these these cubiclium, we actually have the walls extend in space because you see that they're painted, trying to give you more of this storybook. Now, we might have books on our shelves to tell, that we've mentioned a couple times that we really enjoy, but instead, you can actually see there's a change in the flooring. We go to start seeing images, pictures that relate to their myths. And then we also, guys, they are extremely small, something I see, and they're really, really, really tiny. You could probably touch them if you put both walls, if you put your hands on either side, and as someone that lived in New York City, Trust me, you could probably find an apartment still available like that, where you could touch your walls as small as the cubiclium. Um, but what's really interesting is, is that this wasn't a place that they spent a lot of time. It was a functional place. It's where they went to sleep. It's where they got dressed, unlike how we might use our rooms today. So when we find other artifacts, we typically find artifacts like this. So now I want to think like archaeologists again, and I want you guys to use that chat feature to tell me what we're going to do is first tell me what you see, and then we're going to make a guess or an inference. We're going to see which of these two lamps was owned by the owners of our home, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is track our observation. So everybody tell me in that chat box, what are some of the things that are similar? What are simple similarities you see in these two artifacts right here. Yes, okay, great. So first suggestion is we have holes, absolutely. What's another observation? Yes, okay, they both have people. Yes, I love that someone called out that shape that they both have, they're both circles, that we have holes, we have people. Good job, does anybody, anybody else notice anything we haven't mentioned just yet? All right, I think, oh, yes, I love that word motif. It's so great. Both have large parts of the on the bottom. Guys, so good. And I like that we called out some of those figures that we can make out, those that look like soldiers. Very good. All right, great. Now, you are absolute, all of you guys impressed me so much because the first things you did was you named some of those basic features. We see that this is circular. We see that these have two specific holes in the same general area. I love that someone just said it looks like it, uh, one of these actually looks like there's a sundial. I can see that right here. And we also talked about this idea that there's a design element. Now, that actually helps us understand more about the function. Now, what ancient Romans would do is hold these oil lamps in their hands. So their hands held, and they'd be about two inches off of the hand, okay? They would come with two different holes, one that sits in the front and in the back, and the middle hole centered onto that design area that you guys called out is actually where olive oil would be poured in. That olive oil would create a puddle within the oil lamp that sits up, and then that top hole is an area where you would place material 
for it to be lit, for the lamp to be lit, and then for you to kind of illuminate the darkness. Now, this is actually one of my favorite artifacts in the museum because we find out that this is not just an ancient world artifact. This is not just one, uh, one uh, ancient world civilization that's using this. Instead, we actually see artifacts like this still used today. You guys might have some connections. I had some really special students uh, share with me a connection to a special lamp that uses seal fat as opposed to oil like what we see here. But there's a really, really, really special connection that we can all look in and see that uh, see these uh, different forms of connection. Now, what I also like to say is that uh, these oil lamps help us also know that this one here, because you guys did such a good job telling me, the one that has that deeper motif and also has a much fancier material, this is made of metal. This actually was, was what was, um, owned by those that were living in the house, okay, because they had that big wealth, where this here actually would be made more clay and pretty available to anybody. You guys are so good. Final thing we're going to do is just jump through the back, because I want uh, you guys to ask questions, and so I want to leave at least five minutes for that. So I do want you guys to know that there was an education portion to this. Um, this is the tablinum. It's kind of like the home office, and what would happen is the students of this type of uh, family would be learning the way we are today. We'd be learning, uh, it would be like home-based learning, and this is also where all of the, like, kind of the, 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 the business of the home would go down. Now, next door is the Perry style, which is set up like a courtyard and a place that's left open at the very top on purpose because ancient Egyptians would make very, would make daily offerings in this area. Right here at what's called a household altar called a lorarium. These would be smoke-based uh, smoke based offerings, so you would want that open to have the smoke billow up to the gods to please them. And we see here that we actually didn't escape total destruction. Right here, this missing pillar, that's because of Mount Vesuvius and the destruction of the volcano. But what we do see is that we have a connection to the family, the ancestors, because just like some of us may in our houses, they would decorate this area with stone portrait busts that would help us, uh, that would be of pictures of their families, those that were there before. So um, some of us were talking about these looking like they were made of specific clay. They are actually all made of marble. We did find them in the Perry, like in what would be that Perry style area. And I just had a question. Do you, would any of you want to look like our matron here for eternity, would you want your artist to make sure that you look uh, that you look like this for all of eternity? I had the first person to say no. <laughs> I agree, right? I don't know if I would exactly want to look like that either. So it did it did take a very long time to carve out of marble, which is one of our comments. And many people are saying no, thank you, nope, not really, nope, nope, nope. Again, I love it, and I want to be happy. That's really great. So. There's one suggestion, maybe you don't want to look like her, maybe you don't want to look like this individual because she looks like she's frowning, like she's going to yell at you to get off the lawn before you've ever done anything. What's another reason you may not want to look like her? Or be captured like this for all of time. Okay, someone else said that she looks like she's of an older age, right? She looks like she might be of an older age. Maybe that's not exactly the way you want to be held up for all of the rest of time for your artifact. And what about that? We talked a little bit about the expression, but what else is included on her that makes us think that she's of an older age? And I hear you, being young forever is great, but remember those vampire stories totally exist for a reason. <laughs> Good and bad to all. So what is, what's another feature uh, included here that makes her, makes her look like she's of an older age? Is this supposed to be, I think we have some suggestions of the, of the frowny face, right? That she has some wrinkles, right? She has this headpiece and she has some wrinkles. You guys are so polite. Now it's like the artist totally forgot the Snapchat filter. And I always like to say, or the, you know, their Instagram filter. And she does look really mad. She doesn't look like she's smiling enough at all. And what I always like to say is that in the ancient world, trust me, it was hard to get to those wrinkles. They were worn with pride. But this idea of it being a really truthful picture, not something like edited, like what we do today, actually helps us know when this individual lives. 
these individuals actually living in the 42nd in the uh, 42nd year of the first century and we know that based on her fashion you guys mentioned what she's wearing on her head and you can also see all of that fashion that's draped around her neck so that's one example of why even though she may look a little bit older or a little bit more stern than we would want to, it still is a very, very truthful depiction. You guys are so good. Now our final place, guys, is our Kulina. The Kulina is a kitchen, and that is actually sat right next to the latrina. The latrina is the bathroom, if you can believe it. And no, it wasn't to try to make sure everyone stayed. In. Seriously, I got a question, seriously. Seriously, the bathroom was inside the house, which is still something that's like a privilege today. And we still, we know that it was actually connected there, not because of any of the things that might be jumping to your mind. And it is empty. They didn't have the fixtures we did today, only a specific hole. Instead, what they would do is this would actually be a specific area, okay, that had to have height. You guys may have learned a little bit about the water system there, water going to and from the house. Both of these are necessary. So that's why the two rooms that need that most are placed next to each other, not running around the house like we do today. Now, the Kulina, remember, this is our Tabernai Kulina. It's super fancy. It actually looks really pretty. We even see right here, there's a little bit of decoration, like a poster you might see in your area, uh, like in, in a store that you go to in your area. And community and in the back this is the house this is the part of the house that's typically used by people working for the homeowners so that's why this isn't very decorated okay and that's the trust me the latrine is not much to see it's just a room so i didn't show that picture <laughs> sorry guys and then finally where we would end and we can uh, ha answer any questions is this really fancy space called the triclinium which is kind of like a dining room and this is the area that people would actually go it means the room of three couches and this is where people would put on their togas and have big, big parties and feasts. So I'm going to stop sharing because it looks like we're, at, we're kind of getting towards the end. And I want to make sure that, um, that we get time for questions. So if you guys have questions about our program or about anything else you want me to answer, I'm happy to ask. But I did see one that I wanted to, while you guys are doing that, I did see one I wanted to make sure to answer, which is the laying down and eating. Yeah, they did. Actually, around that three-part sofa, they would sit putting all of their weight on one, on one side, so they'd recline like this, and this would leave the other hand open to kind of eat and drink anything they'd like. And this would typically be a feast only attended by men. Really great question. Cool. And one question that was way, way, way back from... Oh, I'm sorry. What, oh, it's totally fine. What did the Romans wear? Because I know that we see, often see two different kinds. We see the gladiators wearing one thing and we see the uh, people wearing another. Great question. So what people typically were wearing actually had a really big connection to kind of how they were seen in society. So the, ver the differences would change based on kind of your class. For example, someone that was considered a nobleman, right? They would actually have a clean shaven face. It would be actually a really big tradition in the, in, um, the, the like kind of step toward manhood. And as we saw previously, people of an older, um, of an older age of women, they would actually wear a headdress on the, that similar style of headdress. But typically what they would all wear is some type of tunic, which is kind of like a very thin linen. They didn't really wear pants. They didn't understand them. And if you were in the army, you would have a different type of shoe that would probably be made more, uh, that would add, and a different type of the shield and um, kind of like a smaller tunic than what you would wear around that would be longer if you were a citizen not connected to the military. Really and great question. And then they would kind of be dressed up um, in different ways, maybe a belt or a chain or a piece of jewelry for our um for the women and their and that, would be a whole, that could be a whole other session. And that was Hazel's question. I'm sorry, Hazel. I knew sorry about that. Thank you so much. And Gabriella says, no pants? <laughs> I know, no pants. And the togas, guys, the togas were actually really, really, really cumbersome. So they were really hard to like move around. So that's why you all, it was like getting in your fanciest dress, even though you might feel so, so, so good. Bye, Elliot. Um, even though you might feel so good in it once you're in there, it's also kind of like sometimes you want to make sure it keeps really, really in good tack. It might be a little bit more than you bargained for on some of the outfits yeah. you have to keep all together. So that could be a whole other thing. What did people wear in ancient civilizations in different countries? But we can talk about that later. 
So yes. thanks everyone for coming. I know this was a great session and it actually works out really, really well because our next session is all about volcanoes and tectonic plates. So we can ask Darren how volcanoes, or he's going to explain how volcanoes happen, which is so exciting. And you can make some connections to Mount Vesuvius. I was so impressed that you knew so much about Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius. That was amazing. Me too. So you guys have so much. <laughs> I am going to direct you guys to go back to Connected North at Home um, website. And if you go into the resources and then Penn Museum, we have the map of the house that you can go and fill in from what you remember of the session or even watch the session again and fill it in and um, and make some comparisons between your house and the ancient Roman house. So again, thanks, Miss Allison. You're Thank always you. so wonderful to connect to and we'll see you so, so soon. And hopefully, if they can't get over the no pants. I know, guys, it's so crazy. And then eventually in that area, they start wearing color to tell everybody about what time. they they went to stockings. So they went to the tightest kind of pants before yeah. they actually were wearing different pants, which I think is great. I think they're laughing. So thanks, guys. We'll see you later. And Bye, um, thanks, Allison. Thank you. Thanks, Miss Allison. Thanks.